Uh, last time we were looking at the conquest narratives in Joshua, uh, such as they are, uh, the, um, we tend to think of the first half of the book of Joshua as full of conquest narratives, but in fact there are very few of them in there. And all of them bear the marks of the idea of a holy war, which we picked up by looking at Deuteronomy 20. So from the standpoint of the Deuteronomistic historian, the entire conquest of the land was initially a divine war of Yahweh, and it fit perfectly within the same pattern as God's <clears throat> divine war against the Egyptians. So there is a, a, a major resonance of the exodus from Egypt in the conquest narratives themselves, including the way that the crossing of the sea is shaped in the uh, account in Joshua, where you get uh, very strong resonances in vocabulary to the description uh, earlier in Exodus about the crossing of the sea. Uh, the book of uh, Joshua ends, as we indicated last time, uh, with a covenant-making ceremony in chapter 24. Uh, the significance of this is obvious, and it is signaled by a little uh, passing remark at the very beginning of chapter 23, immediately before uh, Joshua gives his farewell speech, and uh, uh, then uh, has the people make a covenant. The very beginning of chapter 23, <coughs> A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies all around, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, and so on. That phrase, to give rest from all your enemies round about, is a trigger phrase for Deuteronomy. Uh, it means that the covenant is now in effect. Israel has been brought safely into the land as God had promised, and the land has now been given to the Israelites, and all of their enemies have been defeated, according to the way the Deuteronomistic historian is telling this story. Uh, just to make sure that you understand that, the new generation, which was participating in the conquest, but which is the generation that survived from the wilderness, the generation born in the wilderness, now makes its own covenant. Remember, for Deuteronomy, each new generation has to take on itself the demands of the covenant. And the people do that in chapter 24. That means that all of the requirements of the Deuteronomic covenant now are expected to be obeyed by the Israelites. And so uh, we need to remember that when we begin to go into uh, the book of Judges. We are prepared for what is going to happen in Judges by Joshua's surprising remark when the people insist that they are going to worship Yahweh. And they will agree to this covenant which Yahweh wants to make with them. And instead of uh, Joshua saying, good for you, I wish you well, I'm going to die now, uh, he instead says, you cannot worship the Lord your God, which is a strange thing to say, having brought them this far. But uh, here uh, Joshua is being almost prophetic and telling them what in fact is going to happen now once they are safely in the land. So uh, the book of Judges now opens with the remark that uh, after the death of Joshua, the people now again apparently have to recapture the land. There is this repeated story in chapter one that makes it appear that in fact the Israelites have not captured all of the land. The land is not yet theirs. And uh, more to the point, there are a number of the original inhabitants of the land that have not been wiped out, as Deuteronomy suggests they should be, but instead are there. And they're going to be a problem for the Israelites. Uh, if you uh, look at, uh, just as an example, an important example, in uh, chapter 1, verse 29, 
Ephraim, for heaven's sakes, the, the largest of the northern tribes, did not drive out the Canaanites from Gaza, but the Canaanites lived, uh, lived among them in Gezer. And Zebulon did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of uh, Nahalal, but the Canaanites lived among them and became subject to forced labor. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko, and on and on it goes. It's a list of nations that were not, in fact, driven out, and all of these original inhabitants are there. So the outline of the book of Judges is by this time fairly clear. Uh, this is going to be a story about the uh, dangerous interactions between the Israelites and the people who have been left in the land. And just as Moses had feared, uh, and just as Joshua had predicted, the people will not be able to resist the worship of uh, other gods introduced by these remaining inhabitants in the land. And so at the very beginning, we get a divine description of what is going to happen now in the book of Judges. And it occurs beginning in chapter 4. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I had promised to your ancestors. So this is quoting Deuteronomy. Uh, God is here speaking through the angel, uh, which is a... Uh, a typical kind of northern thing, I think. It appears mostly in the Eloist in the Pentateuch, and here it appears in a Deuteronomistic uh, speech. And I said, this is God speaking, I will never break my covenant with you for your part. Do not make a covenant with the inhabitants of this land. Tear down their altars. Here we're quoting Deuteronomy. But you have not obeyed my command. We already know this now from chapter 1 and all of the unfinished business that the people have left. You have not obeyed my command. Look what you have done. So now I say I will not drive them out before you. So God is not going to help in this second effort at clearing the land. But they shall become adversaries to you and their gods shall be a snare to you. And when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the Israelites, the people lifted up their voices and wept, and so they called the name of the place Bochim, that is, the ones who weep, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. Uh, you would think that instead of weeping, the uh, Israelites might uh, resolve to actually clear out the land, but they don't really do that. After the death of Joshua, we move on to uh, chapter three, and we get an extensive list of the people that were left in the land. These are the nations that the Lord left to test all of those in Israel who had no experience of any war in Canaan. Uh, it was only that the successive generations of Israelites might know war to teach them uh, with those who had no experience of it before. This is an effort to try to, fi to uh, f uh, figure out just what God is doing here. God cleared out the land, and now suddenly it needs to be cleared out again. How does one explain that? And you get the sort of lame explanation here from the Deuteronomistic history. Uh, instead of saying, you know, uh, I've really got a couple of accounts of this going here, and they don't match each other, and what are we going to do about that? So there must be some reason that they now have to do this. This must be part of a divine plan. So the, the Deuteronomistic historian invents a new motive and says, well, God was worried that the Israelites, having had such an easy time of the conquest because I did all the work, uh, and don't know how to fight a decent battle, and that's going to cause them problems later on. So I left deliberately all these people left in the land so that they would have an experience. This is not going to wash, uh, and we'll see time after time that uh, as uh, Israel progresses in this uh, pre-monarchical period of the land, 
that uh, things simply do not go well. If they have not learned to fight, they're certainly not going to do it here. So uh, the people uh, are going to have to be on their own. Uh, so who is left in the land? These are the nations that God left. Uh, the five lords of the Philistines, all of the Canaanites, uh, the people of Sidon, uh, the Hivites who live in Mount Lebanon from Baal Hermon as far as Lavo Hamat. Uh, they were there to test Israel to know whether or not they would obey the commandments. And of course we know the answer to that already because the, the angel of God has already told us at the beginning what is going on here. So things do not know well, and we immediately launch into a series of stories, all of which have exactly the same pattern. This is typical Deuteronomistic historiography. If you don't get it the first time, you'll get it the second, and if the second doesn't do it, you'll get it the third time, and so on, because this, these are all gonna follow exactly the same pattern. And they are roughly the same pattern that the uh, angel uh, sort of in, implied was going to occur, but without giving us the great detail that these stories are going to give us. Uh, the stories themselves are so, somewhat interesting. Uh, they are uh, all northern in origin for the most part. Uh, that is to say, all of the geographical references to the places where these stories are set seem to be in the Ephraimite or Israelite area, that is the northern part of the country. We have very few Judahite stories here, or Judahite sites that are told. For many of the stories, there is not a great deal of detail. Uh, the main outlier there is the Samson cycle, which uh, has four whole chapters devoted to it in this narrative, and probably that simply means that they had a lot of uh, oral tradition about Samson, uh, somewhat uh, uh, like some stories of the settling of uh, the uh, American West and so on, where you get stories about great hero figures, Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox, for example. Um, both of whom were gigantic in size. If you ever visit tourist attractions out in that area, in the lumber area where these stories originally arose, you won't have to go very far before you see some little roadside tourist site which has a 30-foot tall statue of Paul Bunyan to give you some sense of what we're dealing with in terms of scope. So Samson seems to have been that kind of character. Uh, the stories uh, about these uh, judges, and I use that term in quotation marks because they don't really, uh, when they use the word to describe these early figures, they are really not judges in the sense that we think of them, that is people who are judicial figures of one sort or another. They really fit the pattern of these temporary chiefs that we talked about when we were looking at the lineage systems and said that from time to time these independent lineages delegate an individual to lead the lineage in times of distress. In this case, the distress is always military and usually against the Philistines, although we have some Moabite uh, problems and, and other things. All of these generally fit the pattern of northern Israel as it tried to um, bring itself into a single nation, and it most closely resembles what's going on in the period of Omri in the eighth century. So it's somewhat later than uh, Deuteronomy would like to place this, this group of stories, but the enemies are the same and the difficulties are the same. That is, the problem with the, that the North had in trying to get itself into a unity, a governmental unity, and we see this already in the stories about Saul uh, that early. Um, and uh, David, we'll, we'll come to that uh, next week. So uh, 
these people are trying to get themselves in a unified uh, government uh, so that they can successfully beat back the Arameans and the Philistines and the Moabites and the Ammonites and everyone else who is out to get them and to keep them from forming some kind of a government. So that seems to be the general background of the stories. Beyond that, these stories breathe the air, which is sometimes called by scholars a warrior culture. That is to say, they are from a period in which there are a lot of these hero stories uh, having to do with great military exploits of one warrior or another. And here they are awfully close to uh, the stories of the Iliad, for example, which are set in about the same time period in Greece. Uh, you have uh, Achilles being the principal warrior figure there, along with Odysseus uh, in the Odyssey. So uh, these sorts of stories are typical in many different cultures. Warrior stories of this sort uh, are, my, are mostly, uh, obviously, focused on battle. And so you get a lot of war stories here. There is a lot of uh, blood here, which is typical of the warrior culture. Uh, there is also a kind of crude humor, which goes along with this. And everyone who has been in the military knows that that culture still survives uh, into the modern period. Uh, so uh, you can expect that in these stories. We probably would see a lot more humor if we could read this in Hebrew and if we knew what some of the words meant. Uh, but there are a lot of word plays in here many of them salacious. This is not something you're going to have an easy time reading with a congregation. Uh, I would stay away from these stories, <laughs> frankly, uh, unless people bring up the subject uh, and then you have no choice but just swallow hard and try to do the best you can with this. Um, they are not stories that we expect to be biblical. Uh, but they do come out of a period when Israel was trying to establish its own identity, uh, particularly in the north, and by transfer uh, involving the south as well. So uh, even though the south does not uh, appear explicitly, Deuteronomy wants the south to sort of partake of this culture that uh, was more common in the northern kingdom. And one of the stronger arguments for the original home of the Deuteronomistic uh, theology. Uh, it probably is out of this kind of setting in the 8th century that Deuteronomism, as we will later know it, begins to take root. And uh, the characteristic uh, theology uh, will be shaped by these kinds of events. Because it is a traditional material and each of the stories has its own background and its own uh, setting, uh, but because they are individual stories, we don't have the same amount of detail in all of the stories. So some of these stories just tell the bare uh, outline of the story as the Deuteronomist wants it to be and does not give you any further detail about it. Uh, and then there is, in typical Deuteronomistic style, a kind of judgment on these judge figures and how well they did. Uh, this will be explicit when we get to the Book of Kings, where the individual kings are introduced with the remark, King so-and-so, uh, king of Israel, uh, became, uh, began to reign in the reign of King X, king of Judah, so there is a, a way of, of bringing the two kingdoms in line with each other in the way that Deuteronomy presents each of the kings. And then you get a judgment on how well the king did. And king so-and-so of Israel did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, sometimes they tell you what that means, often they don't, because from the standpoint of the Deuteronomistic history, we'll see that all of the northern kings, by definition, do what is evil in the eyes of the Lord. The idea of having a good northern king is just not in their playbook. 
So uh, the Southern Kings are a little different. You have a couple of them who are uh, unambiguously praised and then others who have a kind of modified good judgment uh, leveled against them. Usually the complaint is, well, they did what was good in the eyes of the Lord, but they did not uh, remove the high places. They allowed the high places to remain in Judah, and uh, that, of course, is a problem. But they did all right. Other than that, that's okay. Um, so there is a judgment rendered against each of these judges, and it's a very subtle judgment. Uh, the judgment, de how well they did, depends on the number of years that the judge is said to have reigned. And they do this by generations, taking 20 years as a generation. So a sort of so-so judge will uh, reign for one generation. That is, he doesn't, there is no uh, line that stretches out beyond that. So they get 20 years that they exercise the office. Uh, if they're a little better than that, it's 40 years. And we actually go all the way up by 20s to 80 at the top, and somebody that you've never even heard of and have no idea what he did, uh, but apparently he was the best one around. Uh, so um, we, we see this kind of uneven treatment, but there is this subtle, uh, typical deuteronomistic evaluation that is keyed to the number of years that the judge is said to have exercised power. Uh, the perfect example opens the collection with Othniel. Now you probably have no idea what Othniel did, uh, or who he was, and we don't know anything about it anyway because the writer doesn't tell us. Uh, but the general outline of the story is classic and will be the same pattern as all the others. So the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, forgetting the Lord their God and worshiping the Baals and the Asherahs. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand, into the power, of King Kushan Rishthaim, of the Aram Nacharaim. So sold them to the power of the Arameans, who are in the north. Uh, <clears throat> but when the Israelites cried out to Yahweh, and this is typical Deuteronomistic theology, we'll see it again in Solomon's high priestly prayer. Uh, in conditions like this, if the people repent and cry out for relief to the deity, the deity will respond positively to that. That's standard Deuteronomistic theology. Uh, so when the Israelites cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the Israelites who delivered them, namely Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. This is typical about, uh, of the description of how the uh, various deliverers are energized, as it were. The divine spirit comes on them. It's a very close analogy to prophetic uh, behavior in this uh, description. So the, the uh, Spirit of God came down on them, and he, Othniel, judged Israel, he went out to war. That's what judging means here. And the Lord gave Kushan Rishthaim uh, of Aram into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Kushan Rishthaim, so the land had rest for 40 years. So uh, that was a pretty good performance, uh, 40 years for Othniel. We have no idea what he did other than this successful uh, getting the uh, uh, Arameans in line and that lasted for a while. And then we move on to Ehud, and Ehud is our first lengthy example of behavior. Uh, this is an anti-Moabite story and talks about the remarkable killing of the Moabite king uh, by uh, Ehud, uh, who the gimmick here is that he manages to get inside the royal court uh, he is a left-handed Benjaminite. And apparently, according to tradition, there were an awful lot of left-handed Benjaminites. Uh, they hired out often as mercenaries because, as in baseball, fighting uh, with the left hand is hard to defend 
by a right-handed warrior. And they come at you from the side you don't expect, and the story turns on recognizing how that works. Uh, and uh, Ehud is able to get his sword into the royal audience chamber because it is slung on his right side instead of his left side. And it, that is so because in fighting with the sword, as I'm sure you all know, having had lots of experience of sword fighting, uh, you, unlike a, a pistol, which you draw from the same side you're going to use it with, you sling it on the opposite side because to get the sword out of its scabbard, you have to reach across and pull it up. And that's hard to do with the hand that is on the same side the sword is slung. So the guards were sloppy uh, in the case of the Moabite king, and they checked the left side, which is where you would expect to see a sword and a normal right-handed warrior, didn't see anything. And so this guy was able to sneak his sword in and then to draw it and kill the Moabite king. Uh, and the result is he gets a nice long story here. Uh, and he, uh, Ehud, escaped and so on. Uh, and uh, Moab was subdued that day in the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. So uh, Ehud gets a good mark from the Deuteronomistic historian. Uh, the next one, you have nothing uh, in here about the person, Shamgar. After him came Shamgar, the son of Anat, who killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad. Uh, we don't know any more about him than that. Uh, that was quite a feat, of course, to kill him with an ox goad. If you know what an ox goad is, it's a small pointed stick that you use to get the ox to do what you want it to do, which is a tall order anyway, if you've ever tried to deal with an ox. The, the phrase stubborn as an ox has its reasons for being. All right, uh, they move right on uh, from that to uh, the story of Deborah, and there are two whole chapters devoted to Deborah. Uh, she is the only female among the judges. She is said to have been a prophet, uh, although we don't see her in the narrative acting that way, she appears instead as a warrior figure here, uh, which, uh, and, and she is the one who organizes a, a series of defenses against the local Canaanites. And um, the uh, uh, fighting against the Canaanites is finally uh, uh, successful, uh, mostly because of the family of Hever, the Kenite, not to be confused with Canaanite. Kenites are uh, from uh, Moses marries into a Kenite family. So think Moses' father-in-law. So we're, the Kenites are somewhere down there on the northern Egyptian border. And the Kenites have moved now as an, a unit of Israel, presumably with Mosaic lineage, up into the land. Uh, so Moses' descendants are probably seen here as Kenites. And the family of Hevar the Kenite uh, is uh, in a covenant relationship, which of course for Deuteronomy you're not supposed to do, but that's forgotten for this story. Uh, and uh, Sisera, the enemy general, uh, is uh, fleeing from the attack, and he naturally goes to the family of his ally, uh, the Kenites, and Hevar's family. Hevar's wife, J.L., has to welcome him because of the treaty that they have with each other. She welcomes him in and provides him with hospitality, and uh, after she has served him suitable amounts of wine and he has fallen asleep, she takes a hammer and a tent peg and hammers the tent peg through his temple and pins him to the ground where he dies, we are told. Uh, not a great surprise. Uh, <clears throat> and so she is the one 
who is celebrated, not Deborah, in what is called the Song of Deborah, because Deborah is said to have sung this victory song uh, at, this, at the site of this great victory. That brings us to chapter 5, which is one of the great old pieces of uh, Hebrew poetry that we have in our uh, corpus. It's about the same age as the uh, poem having to do with the crossing of the sea, which is also attributed to a woman. Uh, and so it is in that genre of victory songs that the women uh, sing after the victory. Um, later on, the song will be called the Song of Moses, uh, but it really is Moses' sister who sings the song. And here it's clear that it is Deborah who really sings the song and creates it. The poetry here is very uh, beautiful in the original Hebrew, uh, but very difficult. It's got lots and lots of strange words in it that we don't really understand, and there are constructions of one sort or another. So if you compare translations of this, you'll see that they are all over the map. Uh, so the irony here is that we're dealing with a great piece of old Israelite poetry, but uh, mostly we can't translate it. So you just listen to it. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, <clears throat> you see the way in which it is now colored. It's very explicitly uh, a part of that holy war mentality and the holy war language. Uh, what uh, J.L. does is said to be in some way guided by the deity who is also fighting a war at the same time against the same enemy. So you have this idea that we see so strongly in Daniel where what's going on on the earth is mirrored by what's going on in heaven. And God is fighting among the representatives of the enemy in heaven in the same way that the people on earth are fighting against their enemies. So the deity is involved in one way or another in this. And that transformation, which was not mentioned in chapter 4, has occurred in the poetic version of the song uh, here. Um, it celebrates the action of J.L. in killing the uh, enemy commander. Um, you see uh, all of the uh, descriptions. Most interesting is the middle of the poem. Uh, beginning around verse 13, then down marched the remnant of the nobles. The people of the Lord marched down for him against the mighty. From Ephraim they set out into the valley, following you, Benjamin, with your kin from Machir. Uh, so they're going through the tribal groups that participated in this battle. What is interesting about this is that all of the tribal groups are not here. And there will be remarks made about that by the poet uh, who thinks that all of them should have participated, but they didn't. And that raises interesting Deuteronomic kinds of questions. You know, this is not all of the people acting together. This is a few of the tribal groups. So the chiefs of Issachar in verse 15 came with Deborah, and Issachar was faithful to Barak. Into the valley they rushed out at his heels. Among the clans of Reuben, there were searchings of heart, suggesting that Reuben, which is one of those southern tribes, did not uh, come but thought about it. Uh, and finally, at the end of the day, apparently didn't. And so the poet wants to know, why did you tarry among the sheepfolds to hear the piping for the flocks? You stayed down there with your sheep. Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. That's not even an Israelite tribe. Dan, why did you stay with she, uh, ships? Uh, Asher sat sil, still on the coast of the sea, settling down by its landings. So they didn't come either. Uh, and so you have a kind of roll call hill here uh, of who came and who didn't and who the heroes are and who aren't. Uh, this is kind of typical warrior stuff uh, that they are terribly interested in. Um, and then you get the, the positive side of that. Uh, one of my favorite lines, because it's one of the few that, that indicates that there might have been rhyme in Israelite poetry. That's been a big argument 
those of you who are taking Hebrew may know that, that there is a problem with Hebrew poetry. It usually works on the basis of pairs of lines, uh, and there is often no sign of what we would call rhyme in Hebrew poetry. But you do get exceptions. In verse 22, which is translated by NRSV, then loud beat the horse's hooves with the galloping, galloping of his steeds. Uh, in Hebrew runs, az halamu ikabesus midaharot daharot abarav. Uh, you can hear the bump pa da dum bump pa da dum bump pa da dum pa da dum pa da dum Sounds like the Lone Ranger attacking. Uh, and so this is one example of a place where you probably have a kind of anamata poetic line. That is, the line is imitating the sound of what is being described. So there are a few examples of that. Uh, the ending of it is so poignant. Uh, because instead of simply celebrating the hero, it remembers the victim. Uh, out of the window she peered. The mother of Sisera gazed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? Her wisest ladies make answer. Indeed, she answers the question herself. Are they not finding and dividing the spoil? A girl or two for every man, spoil of dyed stuff for Sisera, spoil of dad's dyed stuff, embroidered two pieces of dyed work, embroidered for my neck as spoil. So perish all your enemies, O Yahweh, and may your friends be like the sun as it rises in its might. So you have this sort of poignant ending to the song, which is really quite moving. All right, uh, I don't want to go through any of these others, but we have to say something about the Samson stories. Um, the Samson stories are simply full of uh, double entendre, most of it of sexual nature. Uh, the core of the Samson stories are in uh, chapters 14 and 15, and this is probably the old collection of hero tales about this uh, warrior uh, figure. It's hard to imagine, if you conceive of warrior, or a uh, judge certainly as a judicial figure, or even if you think of a judge as someone who can lead uh, successfully the people against an enemy army, you really can't imagine Samson doing anything like this. Uh, he is a kind of typical uh, well, what's the right word? Uh, he is very strong. Uh, he's apparently very large, and he is very stupid. <laughs> and he has a real problem with women, uh, and particularly foreign women, Philistine women. And it will be this uh, aspect of his character, if that's the right word, uh, this aspect of his character that uh, the Deuteronomist is going to be playing with. And the Deuteronomist plays with this core story by trying to set it in a broader context. And they do this by adding a birth story in chapter 13 to introduce the story. And in the birth story, we have one of these barren matriarch stories that we already know and we will run into yet another one when we get to Samuel and the birth of Samuel. Uh, they, those will also fit this same pattern. Uh, in this case, uh, the mother receives a divine message from someone saying that she is to give birth to this superhero who is going to be a Nazarite. And the Nazarites are a group of people who uh, seem to have glorified <coughs> what was considered to be the old style of living. Um, and the old style of living uh, involved not having anything to do with the comforts of civilization. And so they are not to uh, touch anything unclean. They are uh, not to eat food that is not appropriate. They are, above all, supposed to stay away from alcohol and its byproducts. So nothing 
connected with grapes is uh, possible for the Nazarite. And they wear as a sign that they are Nazarites a, an uncut lock of hair. And that will play largely in the ending of the story in which it is revealed finally to Delilah in chapter 16 that the strength of this figure somehow resides in his hair. Now this, this is a Deuteronomic contrivance because we'll see in the actual stories of Samson that uh, he violates all of his Nazarite vows almost immediately. And uh, so he's not much of a Nazarite. Um, but the Deuteronomist apparently thinks the stories uh, are just wonderful stories and he doesn't want to get rid of them. So you can see something of the character of Samson in the stories. Uh, beginning around chapter 14, once Samson went down to Timnah, which is a Philistine city, and there he saw a Philistine woman. Now this is of course in total violation of what Deuteronomy thought Israelites ought to be up to, right? Uh, they're not supposed to intermarry with the people of the land uh, because they're going to lead them into worshiping other deities. This is temporarily forgotten in the excitement about the uh, Samson story. Um, so then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw a Philistine woman in Timnah. You can see the level at which, and this comes out in the Hebrew speech as well. Uh, I saw a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me, because uh, as my wife, the father and mother said to him, isn't there some woman among your own kin or among our own people that you have to go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Samson said to his father, get her for me, because I like her. That's, that's his level of operation here. Uh, no logical explanation. I want to do this, uh, so it's your job to take care of this. Her father and mother did not know that this is from Yahweh because Yahweh was seeking a pretext against the Philistines, uh, who at the time had dominion over Israel. So Samson then went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and when he had come to the vineyards at Timnah, uh, this is just a delightful phrase in Hebrew. A young lion roared out to meet him. You can just hear that uh, thing with the young lion. And the spirit of the Lord rushed on him, and he tore the lion apart barehanded, as one might tear a kid, if you were inclined to do something like that. Um, but he did not tell his father or mother what he had done, and then he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson, and after a while he returned to marry her. So as he comes down, he sees the carcass of the lion, he's visiting scenes of old triumphs, and there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion, and there was honey that the bees had made. So he scraped it out onto his hands and went along eating as he went. And he came to uh, his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate it. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the carcass of the lion. So his father went down uh, to, uh, with the woman, and Samson made a feast there, for so the young men did. So we now get a description of a traditional wedding feast, which goes on for seven days with much drinking uh, and eventually sex. So this is uh, what's going on, and uh, during the uh, course of the feast, uh, they are playing a riddle game, and Samson uh, says, let me propound a riddle for you. If you can explain it to me in the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 festal garments. But if you cannot explain it, then you give me 30 linen garments and 30 festal garments. So they said, okay. Uh, let's hear this riddle of yours. And the riddle is, out of the eater came something to eat, out of the strong came forth sweetness. Well, what are you supposed to do with that? Uh, it doesn't match anything that we know of as a riddle. So how are you supposed to respond to this? The riddle essentially is unanswerable because it doesn't make any sense. Now, as a word play, you can imagine in the context of a wedding feast, you can imagine playing with the key elements of it, which will be strong and sweet. Uh, and if you stop to think of 
bride and groom in the context of a wedding feast, strong and sweet can be uh, fit in a number of different ways into what is going on in the marriage. Uh, there is a heavy sexual overtone to this, if you think of it in that way. And uh, this kind of humor and games that are played at weddings uh, or uh, in our culture before the wedding often turn on these kinds of sexual references. Uh, so I won't, I won't go any further than that to explain to you. You can sort of use your own sense of what's going on. Um, but it's not a riddle as we uh, recognize it. Um, the Philistines, of course, are unhappy that they cannot uh, figure out what's, what's happening here. Uh, and so they go to his wife-to-be, his Philistine wife-to-be, and say, Look, uh, did you bring us down here to bankrupt us all? Uh, we need to solve this riddle or we're going to be out a lot of clothing that we have to give this guy. So uh, you do something about it or else we're going to burn you and your father's house with fire. The Philistines have a very direct way of getting what they want. There is no uh, subtlety in the Philistines. And so, uh, again, this wonderful phrase, uh, so she uh, immediately wept in Samson's presence. You hate me, you don't really love me. You asked a riddle of my people, but you didn't explain it to me. And he says, look, I haven't even told my father or mother. Why should I tell you? Uh, and she keeps at it. And uh, so she uh, you know, finally, on the seventh day, he's had enough of this. And he finally tells her. And so the men of the town went to him on the seventh day and said what, in fact, is a, in the context, a uh, riddle that we can answer. Uh, so the answer to the riddle is another riddle, uh, which it, even we get. What is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than the lion? Well, in the context of the wedding feast, love works for that. So the answer, that's the answer, but that has nothing to do with the bees and the honey. Uh, so uh, Samson figures that uh, his secret must be known. And he uh, gives another phrase, which, another response, which always sounded to me as if it too had a sexual overtone, which I won't go into here either. If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. And so he's angry and he uh, kills a, a bunch of people, takes their go uh, garments, and gives them to the Philistines. All right, so we have the character of uh, Samson established uh, fairly well. Uh, he will uh, eventually kill off uh, a bunch of Philistines with a uh, jawbone of an ass, which gives rise to the famous phrase, uh, which is in Hebrew a triple pun. There are not many triple puns in any language, but this one is a triple pun. Um, and when he kills them with the... Uh, jaw of a dead ox that he picks up, um, or a, ba a, a donkey, rather, a jawbone of a donkey. Um, the word kamar, which uh, it means in Hebrew uh, to be red or reddish brown, and so it generates nouns that have to do with things of that color. So it's applied to the heap of grain in the field after it's been harvested and allowed to dry, and it turns a kind of golden red uh, as it uh, dries. It's refer, it refers to the donkey, the animal, which is thought to be a kind of reddish-brown color, and it simply means red as a color. So to get all these together, you have this wonderful phrase, uh, with the jawbone of a donkey, heap upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. This misses the pun. Uh, Marvin Pope translated this line, with the jawbone of a ruddy ass, I piled them in a bloody mass. Uh, which catches all of the senses of the thing. Uh, you could, a, a better translation that, that, that actually follows the Hebrew would be, with the jawbone of a ruddy ass, 
bloody heap or bloody mass on bloody mass would be a better translation to catch all three meanings of the word. All right. Uh, the final part of it is the Delilah story, which is made up really of bits and pieces of the preceding and illustrates the differences between the good Israelite woman typified by the mother at the beginning of the cycle and the foreign woman who is nothing but trouble. This is an old wisdom theme that you will see a lot there. Uh, the book of Proverbs has Proverbs on this subject and the Deuteronomists are trying to gently introduce that kind of theme here. The problem here is that it is clear that as a ruler of Israel, Samson is a total failure. The Deuteronomists give him 20 years, which is not very good. And uh, the story is immediately followed by this horrific story of the rape of the Levite's concubine. And one of the features of that story is the recognition that inner tribal murder, even of this terrible sort, cannot be punished if the tribes themselves do not agree to it. So you have to have agreement among these lineages if they're going to do anything intertribally. And the book ends, remember, with the comment, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what they pleased. And that is not a positive statement. In the context, it is absolutely clear that the whole period of the judges illustrates a kind of governmental degeneration, which begins or reaches a high point, begins with Othniel and reaches a high point in Deborah, and then is all downhill and ends finally with Samson. And it is clear that we have to do something else. And the something else is the monarchy. And so that is, in fact, the prelude to the stories of the rise of the monarchy in Samuel. And that's where we will go with this next week.